That's good. That May 15th, no, we have a, our annual fact expedition will be at the John J. Audubon Center in Audubon, uh, P Pennsylvania. We'll see a lot of cool history stuff, learn about some of the legends of the area, have a nice walk, a nice uh, picnic, and go to the Audubon Bird Museum. So th that's a great outdoor event. And then in on July 24th, we'll have our annual picnic and book swap. That'll be 11 a.m., uh, just like the other event, 11 a.m., and we will meet at the Fort Washington State Park, uh, not far from the Fort Washington exit off the turnpike on our webpage and through our other news feeds are directions on how to get there. And uh, until real science uh, finishes whacking this horrible disease, we'll continue to meet remotely. We're expecting to continue Zoom meetings with an excellent distant speakers through the fall season where we meet on the third Saturday of the month and we'll have to see what next year brings us. So our speaker of today really understands uh, Randy's message of it's not enough to explain things to people. You also have to be <laughs> entertaining. Uh, Mark Edward has done an amazing job, uh, I, I guess, coming from the other side and really effectively getting the message out on all kinds of forms about how these different parasites work. So um, without, without further ado, um, Mark, take it away. Thank you. And first of all, I wanna thank, I'm trying to get this camera straight. Let me see. Thank you for having me. I, you know, it's uh, always a pleasure <clears throat> to get the word out in the absence of somebody like Randy, it's, uh, it's uh, really a challenge. Uh, and, and I want to make it clear that uh, even though I did write a book uh, on psychics called Psychic Blues, I was never a believer. So I didn't come from the other side. I've always been on the other side. I just, you know, I had to infiltrate it by becoming that thing that I hated most. So my background is in magic and mentalism, and I'm a mentalist. I still do mentalism. Uh, but one of the branches of mentalism that you learn when you do seances is how to give a reading with tarot or hands or palms or rune stones or whatever it might be. So I have uh, developed that into uh, a skill set that allows me to inject cold readings uh, I hope you all know what a cold reading is. I, I'll fill you in if you don't. Uh, cold reading is uh, giving the appearance to a person privately or in an audience that you know everything about them, but you don't really know anything. You're just using a hit or miss strategy where you're continually uh, course correcting based on their body language and their uh, their ability to give you information that they don't even know they're sending out. Uh, hundreds of different ways to do it. Uh, it, it, it can be <clears throat> entertaining. So I spent quite a few years learning that from a lot of really good teachers. And, uh, and, and then I wrote my book. So my book, my book was an attempt to infiltrate the, the larger psychic market, which is huge. It was then and it is now and it's growing and spread this word about how easy it is to not only be fooled, but to fool yourself. So this has been a, uh, a campaign in my life. I've switched over from pretty much switched over from doing magic or mentalism to, uh, to full time being a science activist, which means the fun now with an audience is doing stings and showing the psychics that there are people out there who don't like what they're doing. Okay, so that's the that's going to be pretty much the focus of what I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> Although I'll still do a kid show if the time and the price is right. I don't, I, you know, I love all forms of magic. Okay, from the dark to the light to the 
humorous, whatever. But the, the focus in order to spread the word, because my idea is to always try and reach the greatest amount of people possible. So whoever's listening or watching who is a producer or somebody who wants to dig into this, I invite you to get on board with the guerrilla skeptics. Because what we do is we, we, uh, we get out there and we do things and we do sting operations, which means we will pick a, a particular egregious psychic who is causing a problem in our, in our observations. And we go after that person and we, we let that person know that we know what they know. Okay, so we are not, we are not at all interested in going to a psychic show and standing up and say, you're fake, you know, that's, those days are over. It doesn't work. You just make yourself an enemy in the audience and you are removed. And I have been removed from an audience. And when I sat on the curb outside the door of the auditorium, I felt good and bad, but mostly bad. So we work from the inside. <clears throat> we both mostly work to gather information in the beginning and then we will go to a show and we will let the psychic or medium uh, fall all over themselves and uh, and then later we expose what we found out and how they their methods that they work and we try and get it out to the greatest amount of people it, I don't know if you're aware of the New York Times article excuse me <clears throat> which really rocketed this whole thing forward where we did a sting on Thomas John, who we set up fake Facebook accounts and uh, attended. And it's a long story, uh, but to make a long story short, he went ahead and used all the information that was posted on Facebook. And none of it was true, but we agreed, yes, that's true. And we dabbed our eyes with a tissue and we didn't let him know that we were skeptics. And then later, the article came out, which completely uh, blew the lid off his whole operation. But again, he's still done three television shows since then. So who knows why it goes like this, but we keep at it. We, uh, you know, there are, there are pros and cons to stings uh, because we have to lie. You know, if you're somebody who, who doesn't like the idea of lying, even though that's all the, all the psychics are doing, or mediums when they're on the stage because it is a performance piece. And my background is not only in magic, but it is in performance art. That's what I got my degree in. It's called post-studio art. Uh, it's an area that lies somewhere between art and theater. The theater people were, when I was at California Institute of the Arts, didn't wanna quite call it theater and the art staff didn't really call it art. So it's where you get out on the street and you do something that gets attention. So we've been doing that and I'm just gonna take it for granted that you know the difference between hot reading. Maybe I should just run through it anyway because there may be some newcomers. Cold reading again is telling something, tell, telling somebody something and uh, uh, by certain uh, methods, getting them to say, oh, how did he know that? Okay, then we move into the more dramatic uh, lying, which is called hot reading. Hot reading is where we set up or we do, in, we do a search on somebody and then we, we, will, uh, we will pretend to get that information from some higher source in front of the audience. Uh, for example, um, I, I'm seeing I'm seeing a Russian hat. I don't know where that's coming from. I'm seeing a Russian hat and and I'm seeing uh, the name Gary. So I'm not sure if that means anything to anybody, but as I go through as I go through my lecture, I will try and, I will try and focus in on on what I'm picking up. It's not always exact. And part of the game is to be not too perfect. Uh, and, I, and when I see this person with the Russian, something about Russia, uh, I keep seeing boxes. 
like I'm looking at a screen now and I'm seeing boxes. <clears throat> but this person fills, fills the boxes in or is very into uh, cartoons. Ha ha, gets a lot of laughs out of it. So, so, so there is, there is uh, an example of, uh, of uh, a hot read. So it may not make any sense to somebody. It may make total sense to somebody, but that's how I get, how I get started. Excuse me one second. Okay. So hot reading involves getting information and uh, explaining it, feeding it back in a way that is uh, mysterious. Okay. And it can be mysterious. It can be extremely entertaining. It can also be very painful. So the last couple of lectures that I've done when I've been on the road before the pandemic were basically saying, when does psychic entertainment stop being entertainment? And to me, it stops being entertainment when you stick a knife in somebody verbally and you they start crying because you're talking about their their lost or murdered child and that that child is talking to you or grandma wants to say that she's sorry you didn't have a chance to say goodbye all this stuff it's all it's all grist for the mill and uh it's where i draw the line okay i love good mentalism and as i said i love magic but i don't love uh when uh, when this is taken advantage of because in, for the most part people who are standing in front of an audience and saying that they see this person's uh, dead ghost standing behind them, it is only a precursor for them to get a hook in them and uh, get them to sign up for a private reading where they can end up losing thousands and thousands of dollars, okay? So it's like the show is an advertisement. The show is an advertisement and we know this because we've been to many, many shows and we've seen how they work. In the old days, they'd say, if you like what I did, see my person at the back of the room. And that's how it starts. In the new days, <clears throat> I just did a show called The Con, uh, I, and I highly advise watching it. It's about psychics, uh, and it's with, produced, by the, uh, produced and directed by the director of uh, Penn and Teller's Bullshit which I did the pilot episode, and it was about mediums. Uh, we just worked with somebody who lost uh, $850,000. So it's not like getting a little tea leaf reading at all. So uh, we are in the midst of, and I've said this for several years now, we are in the, the golden age of the con. And I don't mean the TV show. I mean, look what we just went through politically wise and all the lying and all the poor choices that were made. So it's easy to see that people can be very easily led by uh, a liar. And uh, you got to be a liar to be able to do this. But you have to keep up the persona if you want to be rich. And I never, I had a conscience and I dipped, dipped my mind into it for many, many years, about nine years nine years of solid work undercover, okay? And I had some fun with it. Yes, I made some money with it. I'm not proud of that. But in my case, that was the only way you could get into the heart of this matter to, ing to ingratiate yourself with the slimiest psychics around. Because it's not like magic where you can go to a fellow magician and say, hey, how'd you do that trick? And if they're a nice magician, they'll say, here, how, here's how I did it. Psychics won't just tell you what they did unless you observe and you evaluate them over and over and over. And then you start to see a pattern and you say, oh, I see what he or she did there. Then I was able to employ that in my act or in my readings and move forward step at a time, step, step, step. So I was never particularly, uh, you know, I was never a believer. I, I think when I started, <sighs> it was just a way to make some extra money and learn about what was fascinating to me. Because I am fascinated by the artifice of what these people do. And when I say artifice, I mean the tricks, the subterfuge, the misdirection, 
like a magic show, but what I don't like is when it crosses that line and it becomes manipulative. So, you know, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to train anybody to be a psychic anymore. I'm trying to tell you that they're out there and it's buyer beware. So, so real quick, here's the book. I'm just gonna flash it on the screen. It's called Psychic Blues. It's a thin little book. You could probably read it in two days. This has all of my, not all of, but a lot of my experiences. Uh, and it has an introduction by James Randi. May he rest in peace. <clears throat> so that's kind of my introduction. Um, what I think I want to really talk about is, you know, how this affects your life and how, uh, I'm getting something else. Hmm. Maybe it's just a headache. I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> if you're out there and you have any questions, please please send them through because uh, it's good for me to answer questions just along the way instead of trying to do it all at once at the end. So we are involved in stings. A sting is a very carefully calculated and set up method to out a psychic. And we've done it for about the past eight years. And each one of the, each one of the uh, stings is, a, is an operation and each one has a name of a food after it. For example, the first one was, uh, help me here, Susan. Operation. Operation. Well, bumblebee isn't a food, but but we changed our tack. Operation ice cream cone. Operation pizza roll. That's the one that's in the Times. Operation peach pit. Uh, the latest one is called Operation lemon meringue, uh, and we're working on one that's called Operation onion ring, which will hopefully take place this coming Monday. And it's going to be about something that we find particularly egregious. And that is there is a psychic out there, I'm not gonna tell you everything, who is opening up their, well, let, let me preface it by telling you about what has happened. Because of the pandemic, before the pandemic, uh, these uh, people, performers, medium psychics, they would sell tickets to their shows in huge arenas, huge, you know, three, 400 people. And since you use your credit card to buy your ticket and they sold you a seat number, they knew your name and they knew exactly where you were sitting. So by doing that, they could research you. And when the showtime came, the psychic knew what seats were gonna be the target seats going from left to right or however they arranged it. And she would, she, I'm thinking of Teresa Caputo, they would say, oh, why am I getting this? And it, would, and, and it would be dead on. And I mean, you know, there'd be no explanation for it. <clears throat> so when I did a TV show for Inside Edition uh, for, about Teresa Caputo, I went to one of her shows with one of their reporters and he sat right next to me and Teresa goes up to somebody and, and, and it was interesting because she has a whole crew with a microphone and a TV camera and they're carrying it around and they would go to different parts of the room and focus in on certain groups of people. And I started to notice number one, that the crew would get to, get to that part of the room where the next target was gonna be before she said anything about them. So I was like, what's up with that? So they go, they set up, they get everything, they get the mic ready. And she says, I'm getting something from over there. And she will point right to where the camera is set up. And, and she says to the woman, why am I getting pictures of baby clothes? And the woman says, oh my God, that's amazing. I just put pictures of baby clothes up on Facebook. Boom. <laughs> And I jabbed the reporter next to me, did you hear that? And he's like, so that's kind of where this thing started that we're doing. Um, 
but now there's a specific psychic who is just the bane of our existence as a team, the uh, guerrilla skeptics, who is opening up his, uh, it's been done before, is opening up his Zoom channel to doing readings. So now since the pandemic, pandemic, this is very important. Since the pandemic, we cannot get together in large groups like that. So what happens is he sets up a Zoom chat, okay? The Zoom chat makes it even easier for the psychic or medium to immediately get in real time information on a specific person. And I will show you what I mean. Right now I have three screens. I have one to my left, one to my right, and one in the center, okay? So I also, when I'm talking to you, I can see on my screen the names of the people who are part of the Zoom chat or the, the talk. So all I have to do is either have my assistant or I go there and I just look you up and I start reading back things about you as if, oh, I'm getting the impression of somebody who lives in Calgary, Canada. Oof, it's cold, getting very cold. She's a, she's a math teacher and she has three sons and I get the initials, I'm just getting one initial A like this, okay? So I'm sure there's somebody out there who, who is listening who that makes sense to. They don't even have to say what they used to say is they would say, does that make sense to anybody? or they just go straight to the seat because they know where the person is. Very powerful, because you have to remember the rest of the audience doesn't have any idea that this person has been tagged to, to get a very special reading. And it increases that psychic's uh, viability by a lot, okay? So now we have somebody who is doing a Zoom call, and it's for children, children from five to 12 years old, to try and show them how they can be a medium, which is, to me, child abuse. The parents who are involved with this, because it's the parents are the ones whose information is going to get read, and the kid is going to get sucked into it, because what five or six-year-old even knows what a spirit is, okay? So it to me is one of the lowest I've ever heard of. And I've heard of it before. It's this is not new in the in the new new mediums of medium media of mediums. So we have a little plan. I'm not gonna say the name, I'm not gonna say how we're gonna do it, but it's got, we have done everything we possibly can to try and stop this from happening. We've written dozens of letters. We've had very prominent scientific people uh, write columns for us in magazines stating the person's name and what they're up to. And so far, it's going ahead. Um, someone, with the, someone with the initials SV. Uh, could you stand up? Oh, no, wait, we can't do that, can we? See what I mean? Uh, Graham, getting the name Graham and, 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 and a family. Uh, um, no, that's not family. It's Emily, Graham and Emily. They're not dead. <laughs> So I do want to stay in touch with you, okay? I'm glad that I'm getting live people, okay? Because I don't like talking to dead people. So you see how easy it is? Um, so we keep doing this because sooner or later, this guy is going to make a really big mistake. And he is a guy, sort of. Hold on, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway... The, the idea with this thing is to, again, it's not about the audience because they've already paid for their ticket. They're died in the wool believers. Anything we say or do is not gonna make any difference at all. It's a done deal. But if we can get under the skin of the psychic 
and let that person, he or she, know that there are people out there who are working to pull that statue down in a, in a manner of speaking. That's, that's what our job is. And, you know, it is like salmon swimming upstream. It can be very, uh, it, can, it can be unrewarding or it can be incredibly rewarding if it gets picked up and the ball gets rolling and we get letters of thanks, testimonial letters, and we have a lot of them. Susan Gerbic has a file of people who have written to her and said, thank you, I didn't realize that's what this person was doing because most people don't know what cold and hot reading is. They don't have a clue. They just think it's some sort of spiritual energy, which it is most definitely not, okay? I mean, depending on how you define spirituality, in my book, it is a con, okay? So that's my speciality. So I've taken, I've taken my skills as a mentalist magician and misdirection and playing a role and taking it into the area of how do we clean up this mess we're in? So it's part of, part of a way to lever society out of this awful dark rut that we've been in for the last six or seven years. It's gotten progressively worse. But now with the Zoom situation, with being able to just read off a screen immediately, uh, they're winning. Think about that for a minute. The mediums are winning because they're unlimited. And each one of those little squares, like Hollywood squares, each one of those people that's sitting in that window who's bereaved or has lost a child or is, is upset and needs real help, they're getting sucked into this and they're paying for it and they're getting information that seems plausible. So I'm here to say, if you've got a grandmother or a mother or anybody who is uh, experiencing, I'm sorry, experiencing anything in this area, then you need to uh, get involved, okay? Now, that's another reason I'm here is to say, you can do something. You can make a difference in this in this battle. Granted, <clears throat> it may not seem like much, but uh, it is extremely satisfying when you are part of an operation or you you work with a group. Who uh, it's also fun too. It's it's really fun to uh, to get together and and pick at this person. Who, who is really, uh, has no conscience at all. I mean, I could have made a lot of money, but I had a conscience and also I was a magician. So right from the get-go, I was like, this is a trick. What the, what the hell is this person doing? So I think that what we are at right now is a turning point in society where we can actually either let this continue and this whole thing about police psychics, there is no such thing as a police psychic. I know people who've written books on police psychics. Not one psychic has ever solved a crime, ever. All they do is they, they get on the coattails and they say, I helped the police solve this crime. Anyone can say that. And the police don't care. They just want to solve the crime. Maybe they get a lucky, a lucky hit, like she's somewhere near water, you know, and they find the body or whatever near water. You know, I got a sink, I got a bathtub, I got a bird bath, I got a lake near me, I'm near the ocean. It's the same kind of vague, uh, vague deal that they do. So again, if you know somebody who really pinpointed something and which led to a conviction. Wait, I was gonna say, let me know. Don't let me know, I don't wanna know, but talk to somebody and you'll probably find out that it was either a coincidence or the person knew because of some family member or, or something else. Um, 
I'm getting the at the initials again. S S and I'm getting a date. The date is a one. Twenty two. 1990 and so it's January 22nd is that person's I won't say birthday could be it's their lucky day if you believe in luck <laughs> it's their lucky day <laughs> hmm. okay so I don't know who that's reaching out to but again if it was an audience and I said does that mean anything to somebody Usually that person's gonna stand up. Hey, they've spent sometimes over a hundred and two hundred dollars for a seat. So of course they're gonna stand up. Then the process begins to drill down, find that person's weakness, which they may not know, and then they just stay with it until the person either breaks down in tears or is so impressed that they just sit down because they're Ah, their mouth is hanging open. It's not hard. Anyone can do this. Please don't. Randy did this. Not many pe people know this, but Randy worked as a psychic medium. He's not proud of it. He's, you know, he, he certainly changed his mind and spent the greater part of his life exposing these frauds. But yeah, if you're a magician and you get into uh, fake mind reading, it's just a natural outcrop, outcropping of that uh, ability. And it's about selling yourself and, and where you become the, the, uh, the vessel. You don't have props, you don't have birds, you don't have girls in, bo uh, girls in boxes, uh, sp spinning boxes and colored pigeons and all that. Very powerful because once you realize how easy it is, and how much more people appreciate it than standard magic in most cases. It can be very addictive. And once you start believing in yourself, then you are in trouble, you know? So Randy pulled himself away from it. Uh, Ray Hyman is another dear friend of mine, if you don't know who he is. Ray and, uh, and Randy and a few other pe people basically started the modern skeptic movement. And, Ray Hyman is a psychologist and he did palm reading. <laughs> and he's he knows what I'm talking about and he has no problem with it. In other words, a lot of skeptics are like, hey, you do palm reading? Yes, I do. I, I'm not ashamed of it because if it's done right and it's entertaining and you throw a little skepticism into it, I don't see a problem with it. That's why my book is called psychic blues because the entertainment element i'm still into it and i'm not ashamed to say it it's the blues part of it it's the hook that some other people take and try and get in that is the problem so we have a problem and because like i said most psychic readings are just a, a foreplay to get into a person's life and really mess around with it. You know, there's, oh, you have a curse on you. You must bring me a thousand dollars. And, and oh, in the TV show I did, the psychic gives a woman uh, a grapefruit. Take this, put it under your bed, throw, and then come back in a week. But don't, bring, don't forget to bring that $1,800 with you, you know. So the person takes the grapefruit, puts it under her bed, brings it back, psychic cuts the grapefruit open and inside is this black, horrible, massive, matted gunk, like something you'd get out of the drain. And the psychic says, see, there's the evil. This is the evil. I've gotten rid of it for you now. And all she did was just switch the grapefruits. <laughs> it's, it's an old magic trick. But if you're not aware of that magic trick, and how it's being applied, it will scare the hell out of you. And that's that's the fear factor. So the fear factor is brought in, not so much on stage shows or on 
Zoom calls. I got a little away from the Zoom call thing, but the Zoom call thing, we are in trouble, folks, because there's no way to stop it. Because right now we're in the middle of trying to, oh, we've been trying to stop it, this child thing, because it's borderline. I mean, to me, it's blatant criminality of the worst kind. I'm not afraid to say it. Uh, but who do we go after? You can't go after uh, the people who take the money. They don't care for Zoom. You can't go after anybody except the medium themselves. So uh, I'm getting a name now. <clears throat> Nancy? I'm getting a na it's it's a N A. That's why I'm seeing it. Oh, those are those are the initials. They're coming up clearer now. It's like looking at a photograph, you know, developing in a dark room. It comes up. So that those are initials N A. And a wonderful place, Hoboken, New Jersey. Okay, Hoboken, New Jersey. I hope you're comfortable there and I hope it's not too cold. Uh, and if you're thinking about getting that new car, I would wait, wait for a little bit. Okay. Oh, we have some questions. Is somebody gonna shoot me some questions? I don't see it on the screen. Oh, hi, Mark. Um, Becky can read oh, those out to you right now. Okay. I'm on now. Do you want to stop now? Because no. No. Okay. I, I know you said it's easier to answer them throughout the talk, but we've yeah. with our meetings that it kind of derails things. Oh, well then, okay. So how long do you want me to talk before we uh, take um, questions? Let's see what time it is. Another half hour? Oh, no, no. Maybe another 10 or 15 minutes. Oh, man, I'm getting an impression. Becky, are you getting ready? Are you, did you just make plans to make some sort of trip somewhere? Boy, that's really vague. I was going to go to the grocery store later today. No, no, no. I mean, like out of the country or somewhere. Somewhere. I'm yeah. I'm wondering if there's anybody in this group who has not. No, you're not. You're dodging my question. <laughs> a simple yes or no is, is fine. Even if you just thought about it. Oh, wow. If I just thought about it. Yeah, like yeah, I would be a tough audience member. No, it doesn't matter. You you thought <laughs> about some yeah, you thought some, about some trip place. outside of my home, of course. Like like <laughs> you said, you said Italy sounds really good or something like that. Not Italy, no. <laughs> I'm tough. I'm a tough audience. <laughs> no, no, not at all. You just you just you just that's why I'm not getting in the exact place. But that's all right. I may come back to you later. Let's see. You know, you are going to be traveling somewhere internationally. So watch for that. It may start to come up in your thinking, even during my talk. Uh -huh. You'll, you'll start uh -huh. to formulate an image in your mind. Okay. We, we do have a comment in here. I don't usually go to the chat, so people don't put your questions in the chat, but I did see this. When he said, I'm getting a Gary and a Russian hat, I wondered. I translate Russian and I have a Russian fur hat, although I haven't worn it since last winter. What more can you ask for? What more can you ask for? Absolutely. This Absolutely. is, this is, this is, I mean, it's a gift. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> now, um, where were we? Oh, I was going to carry on. So, so what Susan and I, you know, Susan Gerbic, I'm sure you're familiar with her mm -hmm. work. We, before the pandemic, we were on a roll. We were traveling all over the world. Literally, uh, we had just come back from a trip to New Zealand and Australia, and it was really amazing. So I basically act as her opening act. I come out and do my act, <clears throat> basically what I've been doing for you guys, but I don't do any explanation. I just go around the room and, and uh, tell people things about them uh, themselves. Then at the end, the last 10 minutes, then I explain how I did it, and that leads into Susan's 
Susan's uh, work, whatever she may be, may be doing, you know, because we're constantly refocusing our, uh, our lens on different people in different areas of the world who, who are up to this sort of thing. And it's, it was fascinating. So I, I bring the travel up because we've been stuck and, you know, we've been, uh, been hoping that we can get back on track. I'm sure we will, but it's just driving us crazy because, you know, we, we used to say when we would go to skeptics meetings or skeptics in the pub, which I just, to me, that's just crazy talk. Uh, we would go around, uh, go around to places and talk. And they used to say, you know, I'm, and this is what got us into being activists. I'm tired of listening to people talk. And yet here I am, I'm talking. But my hope is that I can uh, generate some interest for people now that things are loosening up a little bit to get out in the street. Again, my background's in performance. I used to do, uh, for example, uh, back in the late 70s, early 70s, I would go to the DMV and juggle. And uh, no hat, I wasn't doing it to pander so they couldn't throw me out. I used to go on street corners and do magic for people, street magic. So getting out in the public is really important because right now there's not too many places they can get skeptical content from. It gets watered down. Uh, you know, we've done some TV shows. I've done some TV shows. Susan has, has been on some. And they want, they want this content really bad. But the problem is, and we have both agreed, that we will not be involved with anything that shows both sides of an issue. Because that seems to be the way it rolls is we get to a certain point, people are like, we really wanna tell your story, we wanna do this, we wanna be in on a sting. And we say, well, are you gonna tell both sides of the story? Well, cause they know where the ratings are. You know, people don't necessarily wanna know the truth about how they're getting taken. And generally a skeptic gets about maybe two or three minutes in a half hour show or an hour show. So it's kind of tacked on just like a, a an aside, or if it's if there's more there's more skeptic content than usual, at the end they'll say, but maybe there is such a thing as telepathy or clairvoyance, and no, no. So it's been very quiet for us. <laughs> you know, we have to make our own choose our own battles, and and one of them is coming up, and we may be successful, we may not. So, uh, but we do need support. And we need people who are willing to work with the guerrilla skeptics. And if you want to see any of the videos of any of the things we've done, you can go to abouttime.org. Because about time project. About, about time project org. Because a couple of years ago, and we started on our major traveling uh, uh, adventure, we said, isn't it about time? You know, it's like, isn't it about time to take out the garbage? And we act actually wanted to have one of our one of our little brief forays into the forest of, of, of believers. We wanted to call it the take out the garbage tour because you know when the garbage starts to really smell, what do you do? Take it out. So <laughs> this is this is social activism and this is it is social and that's what makes it fun. You're not doing it alone. There's plenty of other people who wanna get involved. You just have to make yourself aware and open. And pretty soon you'll find that there's a lot of people that you didn't have any idea about and what they're, what they're doing. So am I getting another impression, Susan? Is that, oh, maybe I'm just getting an impression of, of Susan. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Getting the initials E.G. Like E.G. Marshall. Uh, New Jersey and a brother named a J name. This person has a brother named James. 
it's hard to tell whether I'm getting any response or not. But maybe have a member will, Grace Lee. Maybe people will. <laughs> maybe people will sign in or, or tell me what's going on. Otherwise, I could just say anything. You know, if you are a, a person who's playing this role, you can say at a certain point just about anything. And people, because they want to believe so badly, they will make a connection. They will say, well, I don't, there's no AEG in the, in the audience. And again, I, I didn't mention this, but there's what is called the law of large, no, the, the uh, law of large numbers, which means the bigger the audience, the easier it is to say just about anything and then say, does that mean anything to anyone? And someone's going to raise their hand. Sure, if not 10 people. Yeah, and then you just look at the one that looks the most miserable and you start <laughs> drilling down on that person. And when you see the tears start to come, but what a practice psychic would do is, is uh, hand them a box of tissues. And then the waterworks comes and like don't, this. And don't so I'm getting something about your child who went missing. Here, go ahead. Here's a box of tissues. <laughs> End on cloud in the graveyard. End so yeah, I was. I'm going to end on on the clown in the graveyard. Uh, but see, I don't have an answer for what happened there. Yes. So when I was at Dragon Con several years ago, <clears throat> I was going for an hour show uh, with maybe four hot reads, and the rest were cold reads. And I was doing very well, but after an hour, I started to run a little low on material and a psychic never wants to repeat the same thing, although I've seen it happen. Um, so I had just seen this movie called The Iron Rose, which is an Italian giallo film. That means horror film. And in the film, there's a scene where you see a clown putting flowers on a grave. He's dressed up in a clown outfit. Thought it was pretty odd. So I decided to just take a left turn and I said to the audience, I'm seeing a clown putting flowers in a graveyard. Does that mean anything to anyone? And this was about 300, 400 people in the audience. And I wasn't expecting anything, but what do you think happens? Somebody raises their hand. That's me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> And she stands up and she, and oh, and then I said, and her name is Shirley. And yeah, this person stands up and, and she says, I don't know how you knew that, you know, because they're used to, what was her real name? Sharon, I think. Sharon, I, she says, uh, uh, you know, I used to live in a very small town and there used to be this guy who, on Sundays, he'd dress up as a clown and he'd go put clown on, on the graves. And he used to call me Shirley, but my real name is, no, he used to call me Shirley, but my real name is Sharon. The flowers in the graves. Putting flowers on the grave. So now I am stuck with a very interesting impasse in my show <laughs> because at the end, I'm supposed to expose how I did everything. I don't know how that happened. I, and, and I'm supposed to stay in character. So at the last part of the show, I'm explaining it. And I just ignored her because that happens not very often, if at all. But it does. And it really is a difficult situation as a skeptic to explain. So, uh, man, I'll never forget that. So it shows you the law of large numbers can work, but it can also work against you because... There's no way I could have known that, and which, which is a phrase we love to hear. Susan and I, both of us love to hear it when people say, there is no way in the world he could have known that. And we often say, oh, yes, there is. And then we do our, our thing. But in this case, there's no way I could have known that that would stick. So I'm thinking, is this an actress? Is she putting me on? What is going on here? So we just chalked it up to coincidence, but basically getting the name and the clown of the graveyard was pretty impressive. So I think I made some, not wanting to, I ended up making a few believers in that show. Oh, and good again, job. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and, and again, the easy way to do that is you just have a plant in the audience. Yeah. But then it's too perfect. And we've seen too perfect before and we can smell it. It's, it's like you smell a rat when somebody's too perfect. But these are the things that happen. So yeah, there are experiences that we, that we have uh, managed to work our way through. Crazy stuff, but fun. Yeah. Very fun. Walk off the stage just going, what the hell? How did that happen? But just a coincidence. Just of course, but it's a double, it's a it's a double coincidence. It's two coincidences in one. Of course. Yeah, I know. But since you built up all of this believability in the audience and you you say you're a skeptic, it can have this effect where people say, Oh yeah, all those other things he said were phony, but that clown in the graveyard, you see. I mean, I know we're, we're adults, but a lot of people don't have the benefit of wisdom gained over years of experience. There were like 16 and 17 year olds that were like, damn, he's real. And you, I could not convince that woman that I was not real. And she came up afterwards and she was just, she says to me, I was just about to throw up when you said that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm glad you didn't, you know, I, really? that's a showstopper I don't need, you know, but thank you. And blah, 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 just going on and on. It was, it was crazy. So clown in the graveyard, just remember stuff happens. And, and the, the savvy psychic will take the opportunity to make everything out of that. Careers have been made on things like that. Okay. And when you try to explain it too much, then it's like he doth protest too much and it can work against you. So, so that's another experience that I've had. So questions? Are you ready for some questions? Yes. I am. Um, and just because you didn't figure, I, I am so hardcore that even scientists roll their eyes at me. Just because you didn't figure that out that day doesn't mean there wasn't an explanation. Um, and we have a question that came in uh, a while ago. Have I'm you still ever... trying to figure it out. Yeah, well. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, have, no, that's, that's, <laughs> have you ever had an experience that you would define as truly psychic? This is one of our um, members. Hi, Mike. Um, I had one, we were driving to visit my parents in another state. When we got there, a friend of my parents called to speak to me and told me I had lost something and where it was. Now, this, this is all very vague. Um, so Mike, we don't know how long ago this happened to you or how your memory may have changed, but she was right and I didn't even know the thing was lost. Still no explanation for that. And, and I would still say just because you can't think of one doesn't mean there wouldn't be one someday, but this is your show, so I'll let you take it, Mark. Yeah, it's, it's like what is more likely that you have some great power, in which case incidents like this are totally meaningless to the rest of the world. Or it's just an odd coincidence. Mm -hmm. Like I had one when I was on the radio. I was I did a. It's a, this is this story is in my book. Uh, I was on the radio in Hawaii, and a woman had lost a very valuable ring, and she was suspecting that her sister took it. She says, "Where do you see it?" And I said, "I, I just went into this general." rant that I usually go into for lost articles, never on the same show. I said, I see it in something that's being moved around and you're not even aware that it's there. It's being moved and it's in kind of a, a square plastic box. And again, I'm just making all this up. <laughs> I said, it seems like it's like almost like in a baby wipes container. So Go and look in your car or wherever you, if there's any baby wipes containers anywhere. Sure enough, she called back the next week, she found her ring in the baby wipes container. So she was a believer now. I had made a believer inadvertently. I didn't really mean to do that. And she wrote a testimonial letter and the ratings for this radio show just went through the roof because she called every week. Is Mark there? Is Mark there? I wanna ask him something. I wanna ask him something. <laughs> So, so yeah, I've had plenty of things like that. In fact, I will say that I, if those certain incidences, those certain synchronicities or coincidence had stopped happening when I first started getting into mentalism instead of standard magic, 
I would have stopped doing mentalism 25, 30 years ago. Because for me, that's what makes it fun. You know, it, it's not like saying that, yes, I can communicate with dead people. But when these really way off coincidences happen, or things that seem eerie and strange to me, and in my character as a medium or a performer, I have to go backstage afterwards and sit down and have a cool drink. That's, yeah, I mean, I could give several examples of it, but usually, like you said, after I sit down <clears throat> and I think it through and I deconstruct it, just like when you take apart a toy and you take the pieces out and you, or a model airplane or something, you take it apart and then you reassemble it, usually you will find the path that leads to the most likely. And Susan and I like to say, what is most likely the answer for that? But again, I think when somebody says, did I ever have something psychic happen to me? You have to define psychic because when I investigated psychics, people would say, you know, we'd make a challenge. Here's, here's a million dollars or here's a hundred thousand dollars. If you can repeat something paranormal, <clears throat> and they'd say, well, I'm a psychic. And we'd say, that, that's meaningless. First of all, define what's psychic and then tell us what exactly can you do that can be tested or repeated, okay? It, it, you know, anecdotes are not evidence. I learned that a long time ago. So when somebody says, yeah, well, I can find water with a bent twig and we go to two months of protocol, to set that up and fly them out to the fly them out to LA and test them and they bomb out. After a while, I stopped doing that because as a magician, there was nothing for me to see. I mean, they weren't, they all believed they could really do it. And when they didn't, they were totally torn up. And I don't like watching people lose. So I kind of got out of that scene. But my point being, Something happened to that person. <laughs> that, did that answer that question? I, I think as, as well as you can. Okay. Um, we have a question. Have you ever had a stung psychic claim that you harmed their livelihood? Sounds like that, that question came from a psychic, but no, we have not. Uh, no, I know who the question came from and <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> We have not, knock on wood, we, we are always, always very careful with what we say. And I think we have to thank for that when we went to uh, England, we went to Manchester, England to, what was that, Susan? QED. QED, which was a, 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 a British skeptic conference. Uh, we learned, much to our chagrin, that libel laws in England are really strict. Yes. And you cannot mention a name of somebody or demean them in any way, or you can get sued and they will usually win. So we and are. You don't have to live in England for that to happen, right? Uh, well, it depends because when we did our New York Times sting, that's one of the reasons we tried to choose, if that's the right word, the New York Times, because we knew they had good lawyers. Mm -hmm. And they knew they would go, go over every step of the way of the sting and tell us if we were overstepping our bounds. But my, my opinion on that is if you're going to be an activist and you're going to make a difference, you need to go as far on the, on the barometer as you can, right to the point where it becomes illegal and then dial back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because the people who are, who are creating these frauds and making millions and millions of dollars, they don't care at all. And if they couch it in religion and they do a prayer or something like that in the beginning of their show, they don't have to anymore because now they're on Zoom, then you can't touch them. It's freedom of religion. Yeah. <laughs> so you are, you know, they don't care. They certainly don't care about going as low as they can go. I mean, look, this thing that's coming up is, uh, about children from five to 12 years old. Disgusting. 
Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. No, we we're we're very careful and very aware of that. I I've, I've been on the editorial board of uh, Michael Shermer's Skeptic Magazine since its inception, mm -hmm. and I also have worked quite a lot with Randy and his his gang when he was alive. So, yeah, it's it's pretty hard. You have to outright go on TV and really call somebody out, and it's better to call that person out through making them nervous. <laughs> In other words, when we do these things, uh, and I can speak through experience, and they know that there's a skeptic team in the audience, you can throw that person's timing off. You don't even have to say anything. And it's like a magician. If a magician goes to a show and he thinks there's some hecklers that are in the audience, it makes him respond to the audience in a totally different way than if he didn't, that he could say anything or do anything. So he doesn't know where we are, he or she doesn't know where we are, but they know we're there. So they tend to, not always, they tend to uh, not make the kind of bold statements that they normally would. So sometimes that's all you can expect. So, you know, we use that idea of going as far as we can as much as possible, because otherwise, why do it? Well, you're actually right now, you're touching on the next question in, in the queue. What do you do to let the psychic know you're on to them? Do you call them out in the session or later? No, <laughs> no, no, no. Don't ever do that. We've learned the hard way. Doing <laughs> anything that points a finger at you during the session, will you will just be hustled out by the henchmen by the big bodyguards and thrown literally out of the building. <laughs> and also the audience says, yeah, you asshole, you just become the bad guy. Yeah. So we person who brings knowledge into the circle. So no, the, the advantage of our method is it is underground, it is guerrilla style. It happens after the event. You know, we will even go to the psychics after show, uh, we'll pay for the after show party where he's backstage signing books and this and that so that we can get even more information and video it secretly and then, uh, then use that as well. Because, you know, you, you have to play the game and their game is a, is a major acting job. So we take that information and then we take it home and we parse it out and we, we, for example, we weigh the things that were said during the show against the Facebook pages, which we have planted, fake Facebook pages. And then we make our story and then we find a media source to handle it. And that's the major thing is it, that he or she will see that in the media and hear about it. And that really ticks them off much more than trying to show them up in the audience because those that, people that don't care. Sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sense. we are constantly on the lookout for media who's willing to take a chance. It's not really even a big chance because we have the proof. We have the evidence. It's up to the medium to prove that they can talk to dead people. And so far, you know, I've been into this for 35 years and I haven't, I would have seen something by now, or basically science would have seen something by now, because I'm, I'm still a youngster compared to the people who, who've really been scientifically looking at this. You can have, you can have an out of body ex body experience, but you're not dead. So you know, it's it, it's like, show me your evidence, and I'm completely open. You know how to find me. I have a web page. <sighs> show me, and. If, if you have something that can clearly be proven and replicated, let's do it because we'll turn science upside down on their head in one day. And there goes religion, folks. <laughs> you know, the whole idea of is there a beyond will radically change. Have you ever been confused with psychic medium John Edward? Yes. <laughs> what a thrill. I, <laughs> to my advantage. Oh, <laughs> yeah, to my advantage, because people do get it mixed up and it really makes him mad. I don't care. 
to me, I don't care because I'm, I'm confident in what I'm doing. But sometimes, what did happen, Susan? Let me just ask Susan over here. You don't remember anything? Well, and I, and I have to say that I was working as Mark Edward psychic before John Edward came along. <laughs> so what could I do, you know? Uh, but yeah, once in a while, somebody, usually they put an S on my name, Mark Edwards. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, there's been some time when people have thought I was related to him, which I certainly am not. <laughs> and uh, no, Edward is my middle name because when I started doing magic at a place here or here in LA called the Magic Castle, uh, Mark Wilson, who was a very famous magician, he just passed away a couple months ago. He was on the board of directors at the Magic Castle and my real name is Mark Edward Wilson. So I chose to use Edward as my stage name. So every once in a while, somebody will get it mixed up, but all they have to do is Google my name and look at my webpage and right away it says science a uh, you know, activist. And that kind of says, Pfft. I mean, there's no unicorns and butterflies on my website yet. <laughs> so um, we have several people asking, what can we do to help? Can we publicize your sting operations? Is there a way? I mean, we have a lot of different questions. Is there a way to start something ourselves? Um, Contact me. The best way to get involved, no matter where you are, I don't care if you're in the United States or anywhere else, is contact uh, my partner, Susan Gervick, mm -hmm. at, on Facebook and say that you listen to the show and that you you are, if you're a reporter, if you're a TV person, anything like that, start there and she will get to work on getting you involved because she, she not only has a huge network of, of people who do things, but she's also very active in, uh, on Wikipedia. She's the Wikipedia trician, they call her, <laughs> meaning she can plug you into some informative ways to, uh, to get involved and yes absolutely there are ways you can get involved you can uh, you can get involved today <laughs> because we i don't shouldn't say anything more should i about else that my, it. What, what name did you give it well operation onion ring i don't know if i mentioned it which mm -hmm. is going to take place mon place monday uh we might be able to get you involved right now no, I don't mention anything. Pro probably not, but it's still it's still nice to know that there are people who want to uh, dig into this. There's there's and you don't even have to leave your house, okay? You can sit right in your study or wherever with your cat on your lap, and you can make a difference. If you want to get out on the street and you want to do different projects, we know people all over the world who who go out in the street. And I really miss that because for me, I am more confrontational than Susan is. Susan works behind the camera. I like to be right out in front. You can also see a lot of my videos at my, uh, my, web, my web page because getting out in the street, is it opens your eyes and you find out that if you're involved with skepticism, it's not quite as bad as you think it is. Uh, I don't want to overplay that hand, but uh, when we did Sil a Sylvia Brown uh, protest in the street in Las Vegas, for example, we had a really nice turnout. And but we but we learned people going by in the street, probably ninety percent of the people walking by who didn't who weren't going into the show, they knew what a scumbag she was, and they'd walk by and go, Ah, she's terrible! Oh my God, what a I won't use the word in the language. And when we walked away from that, we were like, hey, you know, because you get insulated as a psychic, you become toughened and you forget that there are people with brains out there. And that's another aspect of activism that I think is very positive is finding out that there is hope and not everybody goes to psychics and not everybody gets taken for $850,000. It's, it's eye-opening. So go to susangervick at yahoo.com uh, 
Yeah. Does everybody have that? Susan Gerbic, G-E-R-B-I-C. Is that correct, Susan? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. He's here monitoring my every word. Yahoo.com. Yeah. Or contact me. Contact, a message, whatever. Okay. Because what we do is a team effort. And she, she is more uh, savvy on <clears throat> the networks that are out there. You may have something that you want to do that she can immediately just plug it in and say, talk to this person right now. Or like I said, you can get involved with what we are doing. What you can do is take that first step because that is the hardest thing. The first step is saying, don't say, you know, I'm, I'm too tired. I don't have time for this or I, you know, I'm just too old or, you know, I can't make a difference. You can, and it's fun mm -hmm. and it's, and it's very invigorating. The things you will learn and the people you get connected to, you can't find more honest down to earth people anywhere in the world, period. I mean, these are not, these are not scammers, you know, mm -hmm. these are people who are scamming the scammers, if anything. Which is very cool. Thank you. Very cool. Yes, that is very very cool. I think this is a good this is a good topic to end on. What can we all do? And um, <clears throat> thank you so much for your time. It looks like your screen is frozen. It is. Let's oh, see. No, no, no. So let me just add one more thing. Sure. Every 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 town has almost every town has a skeptics group. So besides getting in touch with Susan, look up your local skeptics group and well, go to. Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. That is yeah, us. yeah. You know, <laughs> go and have a couple of cups of coffee and yeah. and and let them know what your main gripe is. You know, a lot of times we will get together with uh, groups and we will we will pick out a couple of people and say, "What is it out there that really bugs you?" And you know, some people it's uh, fake medicine. Some people it's psychics. Some people it's uh, con games. And, and then you'll eventually gravitate towards what your flavor of the month is, and then you go in that direction. But that will not come to your home. You know, Susan will come to your home, but you have to have personal contact to really look at the whole big picture. So a local skeptics group like the one I'm talking to mm -hmm. is really a good way to go. So it has been very nice talking to everybody. I hope I've given you something to think about. Absolutely. You've certainly given me something to think about. Oh. And I would like to just point out my website is www.themarkedward.com. And I also have a hell of a Wikipedia page, thanks to Susan. So <laughs> those, two, those two sources are a really good place. A lot of my books, if you want to learn uh, psychic blues is just about the psychic stuff, but there's some good, uh, fairly decent magic books in there that I've written as well. So I hope to hear from you. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you Thank so you. much. And I want to remind everybody we have an outing at John Audubon Center. Check our website. If you're on our email list or our meetup list, you should have gotten information about it so come out for that and then we have a picnic this summer and um mark and susan you're welcome to come too i realize it involves a plane ride <laughs> yeah <clears throat> well we picnic. might who knows we might be passing through you know we if we get if we get a bunch of gigs in one area or we're we're going someplace else mm -hmm. we try and string like beads string as many different stops as we can so it's po certainly possible oh that's great that's yeah. great Thank you so much. Eric, did you have anything you wanted to say? I just also wanted to join you in thanking Mark Edward for a wonderful presentation. We appreciate uh, the work that you're doing. And Thank you. Uh, we do have the upcoming meetings and when real science beats COVID, we'll be able to meet in person again. Until then, we'll benefit from these wonderful, more distant speakers. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Yep. Bye.